Alright, welcome back. Today we're going over another Shusaku game. This one's from 1842. And uh, I have to apologize, in the last video I said that Shusaku was a 3-don during that game. He was actually a 1-don from what I can tell. I have a large collection of Shusaku Kifu, about 470 of them. But the book is entirely in Chinese, and there's one where it seems to say that he's 3 Kifu in... Uh, 1830, or he's three Don in the Kifu, but all the other ones from that year have him as one Don, and then this game from three years later in 42 has him as a two Don, so I'm assuming that that's a misprint of some kind. In any event, I wanted to go over this game uh, partially because White uses a formation that's very similar to the micro Chinese. Fuseki that's fairly popular these days, and obviously this is way back in 1842, so they wouldn't call it a micro-Chinese back then. But the other thing that I want to focus on this game, other than just kind of covering some fundamental concepts, is how to make use of dead stones. Uh, Shusaku has a group killed off fairly early in the game, but the stones have a lot of Aji, and it's really interesting to see how Black uses that in the game. So. White was a 5-don, and Shusaku was a 2-don, so they started at handicap, but they kind of go back and forth, and I don't know if they the rule was that if you win three games at a certain handicap, it would be reduced. I think that's usually how it went in kind of the classical Japanese go-playing etiquette, because they kind of go back and forth between two stones and no handicap. So white starts off, black starts off, white approaches right away, black makes a diagonal move. This is... Nowadays, we would kind of consider this just a little slow, but in a handicap game, you're certainly you're, you're not really worried about playing something that's just a little bit slow. In an even game with, uh, in a modern Go game with Komi, uh, there was no Komi back in the 19th century Go, so Black had a definitive advantage, even if it wasn't a handicap game. And that's actually really where Shusaku's nickname, Invincible, kind of comes from, is that in reality, he was invincible with Black. He was really good at maintaining his edge through the whole game. And uh, there's actually probably other players more or less contemporary with him that I think are actually considered to be stronger. It's kind of a historical fluke that we're so aware of Shusaku in the West. And partially that's just, you know, because of the books that were translated, the collection of his games called Invincible has been around for a while, and that's how a lot of people know about Shusaku. But... He was a great player, and his games are always fun, so we're going we're gonna to check this one out. Black presses here, and then white's going to jump ahead. Basically, the idea is if black pushes and cuts, white can make something over here. It's, it's a light, light style of play. This large knight's response to the approach on the 4-4 was very typical at the time, and you could totally experiment with this in your own games, because... If this is actually worse than making a small knight's enclosure, the difference is by a hair. You know, maybe on average you get a point less out of this. And if you're a pro, that's a big deal. But if you're an amateur and you want to experiment with things and see how different patterns work, that's always good. And here we get to this formation is generally referred to as the micro-Chinese, although, of course, normally there would be a white stone over on the star point here. But notice that when white plays this approach, white kind of has an eye on building this framework, because now this stone is, is working well with this framework on the top. So white has a very logical plan here. And this is kind of a typical handicap strategy, is build something big and force your opponent to invade it. Because then you have stones around, you're theoretically stronger, you put your opponent in a position where they have to do something dangerous to stay in the game. So that's kind of the logic here. And, you know, this is pretty tight space in here, but Shusaku is undeterred. First, he pincers this stone, and white will go into the corner. And then white plays to reduce the lower side, and black comes right in to the formation at kind of the natural point. And obviously, this is a little tricky because white already has the pincer. So white kicks to keep black from sliding into the corner, which would be a little easy, and then comes out to attack. And Shusaku just kind of jumps away here. And we can see that, yes, 
uh, this immediate cut is sort of working for white. I mean, white can cut off these two stones, but black says those two stones, they're just not important. And while you were capturing two stones and making five points of territory, I just annihilated your framework. You, you have no framework. You have two weak stones and gote. So this would be a disaster for white. And this is just, you know, cultivating this type of light attitude of like, two stones is just two stones. You know, it's not necessarily, the game doesn't revolve around every stone that you place on the board. So instead of, you know, doing that, which would be silly, white just jumps out, keeping, you know, this group, uh, pressure on this group. If white does something else, like say, plays on this side, well now, uh, now this group is getting sealed in and we've got this black framework emerging on the side, so it's really important to, for white to keep these three stones separated from the thickness over here. Black says, no, I want to connect. And now white chooses to cut out on the outside over here. Slides through, black comes out. White pokes at the vital point, and this is, if you can imagine, you know, if white plays elsewhere and black makes this Atari, this is the, now it is very obvious that this is the shape point, and black would very much like to have this. This is really thick, it damages the stone a lot. So that's just not acceptable to white, so white pokes at the point before it's even really there. And now black has to make sure that there's a connection. Notice, though, that black doesn't connect directly and make two empty triangles. This is another thing to just try and focus on shape and see how this is definitely better than playing the direct connection. Even though it gives white this kind of poke later, you've still got the two stones facing to the outside. Whereas if you just connect directly, you've just got the one stone facing to the outside. And this, it's a small thing, but, you know, if we improve these small things, we get stronger, so. Next, white activates a little bit of the Aji in this stone by peeping at this point, and then jumps over here to keep. Now, this is pretty legitimate territory for white over in the corner now, and pretty good size, too. Black turns to the other side and says, okay, you reinforce on this side then, all right, I'll come and take this point and pressure these two stones. And we can see if white had done the opposite, if white now comes back and says, okay, I want to protect the upper side. Well, now this is big because we're tying all our stones together and we all our influence is kind of facing the same general area, which you'll notice there's just one weak white stone in that area, so this could be very profitable for black because this white formation is thin as well. So white doesn't have much help in reducing the center which means it'd probably be good for black. But that's not the game. In the game, black puts pressure here. And this just kind of continues to build up more influence. Black just says, I just want the outside. Give me the outside. And voila. Black gets a little bit of ugly shape, but also makes a panuki. Uh, and this is obviously coordinating well. Black has consistently gone for influence in this game, and it's really starting to come together over the whole board. Like, this is kind of scary for white to look at and think of how they want to deal with it. So, naturally, white does something to come out into the center. Black takes the corner, white establishes on the side. And now, white puts these stones into motion. This is an interesting idea. Basically, White's thinking, you know, I really have to live and destroy as much of the center as possible, so let's just move out with this stone. We've got this guy over here helping a little bit. Let's see what we can do. Black says, no, I don't want you to come out and live. And this is a neat technique. A lot of times you'll just see players just simply descending, which is also fine, but when you play the Hane, you're reducing a liberty of these two stones, and this is kind of awkward. Uh, it's just depending on the shape, this is a possibility that you should consider when white does this descent in this type of joseki. This, uh, the aji of this stone turns up in a lot of different openings where, you know, white approaches your corner and, you know, you back off or whatever, but then, or pincer, and then white comes in and you separate them. This stone always has this descent and jumping out aji. And this is an important move to consider, because sometimes reducing that liberty can be very important. So, it's back. 
White manages to make an eye on the side. Black forces White out. Continues to force White out. Links up these stones, so now everything's safe. And yeah, the, especially with this capture and this capture, now we're just really thick. We're all alive over here. Everything's all good. Now this is, here, this is another good point, is that, uh, and if you watch the last Shusaku video, you'll know that he's fond of ignoring peeps. In this case, he doesn't ignore it, but to just connect here, we can see white makes really good shape. Like this is, if this would be the game, this would be great for white. Like, yeah, black's thick around this group, but with this stone reinforcing these, it looks like white can live down here which is pretty cool. White can make another group take away a lot of potential black territory. But in the actual game, black does not connect. Black comes down here. And the important thing to think about here is this is a good moment to practice our reading because if we're going to ignore a peep, you know, when white plays this move, we have to ask ourselves, is this sente? And in this case, the answer is sort of. Because instead of connecting directly, Black comes down here. And this is very important in terms of resisting, because if white now cuts here, you'll notice that this stone that we played becomes vital for capturing the two. Without this stone here, we can't come down like this. White will survive and cut, and our position will be in shambles. So this move is indirectly protecting against the cut, but it's also making some territory, because now white's not getting this down here. And it's important to notice that in this situation, this is not actually open at the bottom, because when white continues and plays something out here to save these stones, this is going to be black sente at some point, because this threatens to kill the corner. So at any time, black can play this. So when black plays down on the lower side, this is definitely making territory for black. White jumps out. Black says, you know, these three stones, they are really weak. You have to do something about those. And black is taking territory while attacking. Always important. Always important to get something when you're attacking. Uh, you, we, don't, we don't look to kill unless our opponent really makes a mistake. And the reason is, is that if you just look to kill when you fail, you have nothing. So generally we always play moves that gain us something while attacking more influence or a stronger group or territory or some sort of positional advantage because that way when your opponent survives which they are more likely to do than not you have something to show for your efforts so now white has to kind of manage with these stones and you can see this is a really awkward shape for white and there's you know there's helpers around, but this group is still kind of behind enemy lines, so to speak. So now we're going to... Now, the problem here for black is that this corner is not that secure at this point, because there's just a little too much white stones so close that... You know, for example, right now, white can play a move like this. This is not the game. And basically, it's kind of me eye to connect. So if black descends on this side, white can come over here and connect to the outside. And likewise, if black plays something over here to prevent this connection, white can play here, and basically the corner is gone. So this is also why it's important for black to come out himself, to make sure that if the corner territory does disappear, the group isn't killed. So, and here we see white causing trouble in the corner. So black has to take the stone to make sure that black can get two eyes. And this is all pretty tricky. Notice that black's taking more territory on the side. It's not a lot, but there's not a lot of territory in this game. So every point is going to count. And we can see that whereas before maybe white was going to get the stone and make 10 points on the bottom, now it's black making 10 points on the bottom. So that's, that's always a good thing. And now this gets a little tricky because black needs a move to make sure that he's alive back here. Maybe not right now because there's a lot going on, but after this, oh, 
And the other thing, too, is that black can still live, black can play this, and then come down and make two points of territory. But this is really kind of humiliating to have your corner reduced to two points. So, Black says, you know what? We're just going to go. We're going to capture these stones here, which makes some good territory for me. And now White plays another move to definitively kill. Because now if Black tries to make that second eye, White can do this. So, one way to look at it is that, well, yes, White killed the corner and is taking a decent amount of territory, but White also had to play two Gote moves to accomplish that. So, Shusako needs to make up the differential, essentially, in some manner with the play on the outside. And Shusaku did take a good amount of territory, you know, in exchange, and now also has Sente. So let's go back to the game. Uh, black plays here, which just increases the liberties of the, of the black group. And this is the group that I mentioned at the beginning of the game, is how to make use of dead stones. So one thing to notice is that this move becomes Sente right away when white captures these stones because this group needs to have sufficient liberties to kill off this group. So white has to respond. Now black comes and turns to attack these stones because, yeah, these stones don't have two eyes, but neither does this string of white stones. In fact, they have no eyes. And if it comes down to a capturing race, then when you have an eye and your opponent does not, you can count the shared liberties as your own instead of being, you know, your, your opponent's. Because when it comes down to it, you'll have the eye. And basically, at this point, if white just says, okay, wait, I need to kill this group, it's going to be kind of time-consuming. So, in fact, white couldn't kill this group directly. White has to come out and make more, more liberties. So basically, if something like this were to happen... I wonder if this throw in, let's see, uh, let's just do this simply. <clears throat> Here. And you see, white's running out of liberties before black is. So, just to make sure that that's understood, that white has to fight out here in order to actually consider these stones captured. And now, white's kind of in a difficult situation because this group is under attack, and this group is under attack, and they're right next to each other. So, nobody's making any territory here, but black just has to come out with the one stone. Uh, or not the one stone, but the one group here, which is already alive and completely thick. And black has thick positions all around here, so it doesn't seem like white has much scope for making a second eye. And then this group has to come out, liberty-wise. It might have enough with this exchange, but this allowed black to get this attack going over here. So white's still trying to come out with this group, make sure it has definitely has enough liberties. And now it gets really tricky, because white would like to play something like this and keep coming out, but it just doesn't quite happen. So, this is Atari, and then Black would probably play this for good measure, and then come back and fix something, something like this. And now the question again is, what is the liberty situation? And that's, this would be a good time to practice counting liberties, you know, and, and doing some reading and say, well, this is a very important life and death problem. <laughs> Are all these stones dead? And I think in this case that uh, if white doesn't play out this variation but leaves one external liberty on the outside, that they should have just enough to go back and capture the black stones. But that in and of itself is kind of terrible because... This corner looks pretty big, 
you know, like if we were to count this right now, it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 22 points just in the corner right here. But if we imagine that white actually has to go in and remove these stones from the board, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, probably 6, 7 stones white will have to play on the inside to capture these stones. And that means that it's not 22 points, it's 15, which is kind of a big difference. A 15-point corner is pretty standard, like that's not too big. A uh, 22-point corner is doing pretty good. But white knows it can't get knows he can't get any more liberties coming out here and in fact even if black were to play this white would likely have to give up at least these two stones to immediately come back and start filling liberties so white tries to make sure this group is this group is going to be able to live somehow this is a good looking to make eyes on two different sides uh, white or especially because it looks to pull out that one stone which black can't allow and now this, I assume white made this move because they felt that this big chain of stones, here I'll mark these, at A, this whole, whole dragon here, has one definite eye over at B and would probably get one at C or D as well. The E group can capture the F group, but just barely. And it seems like black has, if the black gets this whole corner, then there's no way for white to make up the territorial difference. Because this is actually pretty big down here, because like I said, this descent to F2 is sente. But this gives black kind of, this is where black counterattacks. So I kind of think this move, you know, maybe it was necessary to try and get enough territory to win the game, but... I think it's a little bit of an overplay. And black goes into action right now, playing this move, which is actually kind of neat. First of all, it's, you know, it's threatening to make another eye. So then this black group would be alive, and all these white stones would be dead. But it also really makes the capturing that much harder basically, because now there's a co on this side, white's going to have to fill all these points. So white comes down on the other side. So now if black makes the eye there, white can come here and then fight the co on this side to make sure that they can eventually capture the group. And now black attacks. Black has to attack. And white keeps trying, <laughs> trying to come out and escape. Black manages to falsify uh, both of these eyes, essentially. There's no way now for white to make eyes in here, but white just barely has a way. And yeah, so once, now black can't cut over here, because white can cut over here, and it just does it's not working. So white's going to be able to connect to the outside, but it's not a 100% connection because black can start this co. And this is kind of, you know, this is like for, for all the marbles. <laughs> this is a really massive group, so white really does have to win this. And now this is an excellent co-threat because this is threatening to kill the other big dragon. You can see that, you know, black's definitely got an edge in this co-fight because this group down here in the liberty situation makes it so that black has basically just infinity co-threats threatening to revive his dead stones down here. And it's just a really neat way of looking at the board and saying, you know, what's left in those stones? Like, I know you killed them, they don't have two eyes, you have more liberties, but what can I get out of them? Uh, white also, to be fair, has a fair number of co-threats threatening to just save this group over here. So. There's one of them, but now black threat. <laughs> so again, you know, using these stones, and th this isn't this isn't costing us any points because we have to play a stone on the inside, and if white could respond, like if by playing somewhere out here could make two eyes, like you know, if there were already a stone here and we could play here to make two eyes and make a point of territory, this would cost us a point, which would be terrible. 
But in this case, white has to play on the inside to prevent us from getting two eyes. So we played a stone in white's territory, white played a stone in white's territory. Nothing gained, nothing lost. And now white plays a co-threat to connect out this group. And if black responds to this, white has a lot of these threats to connect out, and there's no way to stop it easily. So black just says, all right, I'm going to take the co then. And this is, this is good because we're capturing these three stones, and this actually is, is fairly big. You know, it's one, two, three, four, uh, six, 12 points. 12 points is pretty good when there's not a lot of territory on the board. And the important thing is, is that white has to come back and actually connect in Gote. So we're also getting Sente. 12 points plus Sente is a pretty victorious co-situation. Because this co-threat was just to connect and save some stones. So it's not really, it's not something that is costing black really anything. So black chops off the tail of the dragon, getting 12 points, but also gets Sente. And this is to fix the shape and force at the same time. And now, black sees away. And this is not exactly normal, because right here, it doesn't seem like black got a very good deal in this exchange, because white got a panuki in the corner, and black got this kind of ugly shape on the outside, and even got it in gote. But there's kind of a hidden meaning to this, because black now has this move. And this is a really interesting one. Because the thing to notice when we go back to black coming back into the corner here is that this whole string of stones from, you know, actually just from A to B to C, realize that after this co, these stones are isolated. They are not connected to anything 100%. It's close. I mean, there's this cut at E that white should get in at some point. But they are not, their eye shape is not definite. It looks like we're going to get one at D and one over at E. But when black decides to do this variation, this actually hurts these stones quite a bit. White realizes this, and it's like, oh, okay, I'll capture this stone, and then black can do this, I'll do this, and now A and B are me I. If black tries to separate me at A, I'll just capture the stones at B. Everything's all set up. Now that I took this territory, the, the game is really close, actually, but now that white took the corner from black, the game is probably better for white overall. But now black plays this kind of hidden move, so to speak, and this is actually going to, uh, in another couple moves, force white to resign. And it's really, really subtle why. Because what happens is white captures this stone, and then, which is almost inexplicable, because we just talked about how A and B were Mii for white to connect. So we would think white just connects the stones. These two stones are captured, there's no way for these to get out for example, if black tries to connect these back out to capture these three stones, there's this little connect and die problem. And likewise, if we do this or something, we just capture the two, and it's no big deal. But <clears throat> black has a move over here, which is G19, which is threatening to capture these stones in a snapback. So... This is a big problem for white. If white connects here, now black can do this, and now all white has is this co to save all of these stones. And there's a couple problems here. The first is black captures it first, but the other is that white doesn't have co-threats. There's nothing on the board big enough for white to make a threat that black will respond to let alone the fact that black has a lot. Uh, even just like cutting here is a huge co-threat because it's threatening so much because these stones are not alive if we break this connection over here. 
Uh, there may still be, you know, liberty removal or threatening this group, but probably, you know, it's just, at this point, it doesn't matter. Whatever white plays, black will simply, oh, and actually, black could threaten to kill this corner, too, which is another, like, four or five co-threats, probably. So this is untenable for white. So when black plays the descent here, white realizes that in order to save some of the stones, white has to come here immediately. And then when black plays here and captures these three plus these others, the six stones in here, this is too much now. Uh, this is worth much more than this corner invasion was. And now things are decidedly in black's favor. So I thought that was a cool, cool end game. Well, not end game. This is still kind of middle game fighting, although it's going to transition into end game real fast because the board is mostly full. But uh, this descent really, really shut down the game for uh, for Shisaku and, and let him win very cleanly. So I hope you enjoyed that. The 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 micro Chinese style pattern at the beginning of the game is kind of interesting. That you know, these ideas have been around for a long time, which I think is really cool. It, this is not really directly related. The, the micro-Chinese is played these days because of certain results from the mini-Chinese, where you get a better, uh, better result from certain Joseki having the stone one point closer to the corner. Let's just go back and look at that. The, and by mini-Chinese, in case you're not familiar with this, is to play here, which is kind of like this Chinese style. Uh, a large extension from the 3-4. And the idea is, again, you're creating a framework. You know, you're not really concerned with directly connecting your stones. Like, for example, it's also Joseki to just play a two-space extension. <laughs> this is also a playable move. Uh, I don't, in this case, it might be a little weird because black could just descend and take a big corner, but, you know, this is just extending two points after you approach is Joseki. And so is extending three points, or doing this. And it, you know, not necessarily when there's this stone here, but if there was a star point stone here, this would be perfectly sensible. But when we go back over here, we're creating a framework. We're creating a large scale framework of one sort or another. And the other idea is that this stone at 017, we can kind of treat this lightly, because if black does invade here, we can just jump into the corner and take the corner territory. And we still got this extension that we wanted. So things are still working, working for us. We have options. We have lots of good options. Now, the micro Chinese is one line closer, and this makes this space over here a little tighter. Now, obviously, there's more room over here. But again, if black says, no, I really want to separate this one stone, 017, that's just my mission in life, is to make sure that stone does not have friends. Again, we just jump into the corner, and there's not really anything going here, we just actually, I'm not sure exactly what the Joseki is from, with the large knight's enclosure. I think it's something, something like this. This is kind of similar to what was played down here, uh, if not, oh, but in, in that it was, um, instead of that, we had this. Uh, either way, um, they're kind of, kind of the same. They leave Aji in different places, but they're both working. And yeah, that should do it for this time. Uh, thank you for watching.